physics textbook of class 11th part 2 chapter 10 mechanical properties of fluid narrated by isna rafat khan introduction in this chapter we shall study some common physical properties of liquid and gases liquid and gases can flow and are therefore called fluids it is this property that distinguishes liquids and gases from solids in a basic way fluids are everywhere around us earth has an envelope of air and two third of its surface is covered with water water is not only necessary for our existence every mammalian body constitute mostly of water all the process occurring in living beings including plants are mediated by fluids thus understanding the behavior and properties of fluid is important how are fluids different from solids what is common in liquids and gases unlike a solid a fluid has no definite shape of its own solids and liquids have a fixed volume whereas the gas fills the entire volume of its container we have learned in the previous chapter that the volume of solids can be changed by stress the volume of solid liquid or gas depends on stress or pressure acting on it when we talk about fixed volume of solid or liquid we mean its volume under atmospheric pressure The difference between gases and solids or liquids is that for solids or liquids the change in volume due to the change of external pressure is rather small in other words solids and liquids have much lower compressibility as compared to gases shear stress can change the shape of a solid keeping its volume fixed The key property of the fluid is that they offer very little resistance to shear stress. Their shape changes by application of very small shear stress. The shearing stress of fluid is about million times smaller than that of solids. Pressure. A sharp needle when pressed against our skin pierces it. Our skin however remains intact when a blunt object with a wider contact area say a back of a spoon is pressed against it with the same force if an elephant were to step on man's chest his ribs would crack a circus performer across whose chest a large light but strong wooden plank is placed first is safe from this accident such everyday experience convince us that both the force and its coverage area are important the smaller the area on which the force acts greater is the impact this concept is known as pressure when an object is submerged in a fluid at rest the fluid exerts a force on its surface this force is always normal to the object's surface This is so because if there were a component of force parallel to the surface the object will also exert a force on the fluid parallel to it as a consequence of newton's third law this force will cause the fluid to flow parallel to the surface since the fluid is at rest this cannot happen hence the force exerted by the fluid at rest has to be perpendicular to the surface in contact with it this is shown in figure 10.1a the normal force exerted by the fluid at a point may be measured an idealized form of one such pressure measuring device is shown in figure 10.1b it consists of an evacuated chamber with a spring that is calibrated to measure the force acting on the piston this device is placed at a point inside the fluid the inward force exerted by a fluid on the piston is balanced by the outward spring force and is thereby measured if f is the magnitude 
of this normal force on the piston of area A, then the average pressure P average is defined as the normal force acting per unit area. P average is equals to F by A. In principle, the piston area can be made arbitrarily small. The pressure is then defined in a limiting sense as pressure is equals to limit delta A approaching zero F by A. Pressure is a scalar quantity. We remind the reader that it is the component of the force normal to the area under consideration and not the vector force that appears in the numerator. The SI unit of pressure is Newton per meter square. It has been named as Pascal in honor of the French scientist Blaise Pascal who carried out pioneering studied on fluid pressure. A common unit of pressure is atmosphere, that is, the pressure exerted by the atmosphere at sea level. Another quantity that is indispensable in describing fluids is the density rho for a fluid of mass m occupying volume v. Rho is equals to m by v. The dimensions of density are ml to the power minus 3. Its SI unit is kilogram per meter cube. It is a positive scalar quantity. A liquid is largely incompressible and its density is therefore nearly constant at all pressures. Gases, on the other hand, exhibit a large variation in densities with pressure. The density of water at 4 degrees Celsius is 1 into 10 to the power 3 kilogram per meter cube. The relative density of a substance is the ratio of its density to the density of water at 4 degrees Celsius. It is a dimensionless positive scalar quantity. For example, the relative density of aluminium is 2.7. Its density is 2.7 into 10 to the power 3 kilogram per meter cube. Pascal's Law The French scientist Blaise Pascal observed that the pressure in a fluid at rest is same at all points if they are at the same height. This fact may be demonstrating in simple way. Figure 10.2 shows an element in the interior of a fluid at rest. This element ABC DEF is in the form of a right angled prism. In principle, this prismatic element is very small so that every part of it can be considered at the same depth from the liquid surface and therefore the effect of the gravity is the same at all these points. But for clarity, we have enlarged this element. The force on this element are those exerted by the rest of the fluid and they must be normal to the surface of the element discussed above. Thus the fluid exerts pressure PA, PB and PC on this element of area corresponding to the normal force FA, FB and FC as shown in figure 10.2 on the faces BEFC, ADFC, and ADEB, denoted by AA, AB, and AC, respectively. Then, F sin theta is equals to FC, FB cos theta is equals to FA, AB sin theta is equals to AC, AB cos theta is equals to AA. Thus, FB by AB is equals to FC by AC is equals to FA by AA. Pressure B is equals to pressure C is equals to pressure A. Hence, pressure exerted is same in all directions in a fluid at rest. It again reminds us that like other types of stress, pressure is not a vector quantity. No directions can be assigned to it. The force against any area within or bounding a fluid at rest and under pressure 
is normal to the area regardless of orientation of the area. Now consider a fluid element in the form of a horizontal bar of uniform cross section. The bar is in equilibrium. The horizontal force exerted at its two ends must be balanced or the pressure at the two ends should be equal. This proves that for a liquid in equilibrium, the pressure is same at all points in a horizontal plane. Suppose the pressure were not equal in the different parts of the fluid, then there would be a flow as the fluid will have some net force acting on it. Hence in the absence of flow, the pressure in the fluid must be same everywhere. Wind is flow of air due to pressure differences. Variation of pressure with depth. Consider a fluid at rest in a container. In figure 10.3, point 1 is at height h above a point 2. The pressure at points 1 and 2 are P1 and P2 respectively. Consider a cylinder element of a fluid having area of base A and height h. As the fluid is at rest, the resultant horizontal forces should be zero and the resultant vertical force should balance the weight of the element. The force acting in the vertical direction are due to the fluid pressure at the top P1A acting downwards at the bottom P2A acting upward. If mg is the weight of the fluid in the cylinder, we have P2 minus P1 into A is equals to mg. Now, if rho is the mass density of the fluid, we have the mass of fluid to be m is equals to rho v is equals to rho h a, so that P2 minus P1 is equals to rho g h. Pressure difference depends on the vertical distance h between points 1 and 2. Mass density of the fluid rho and acceleration due to the gravity g. If the point 1 under discussion is shifted to the top of the fluid, say water, which is open to the atmosphere, P1 may be replaced by the atmospheric pressure Pa and we replace P2 by P. Then P is equals to Pa plus rho gh. Thus the pressure P at depth below the surface of a liquid open to the atmosphere is greater than the atmospheric pressure by an amount rho gh. The excess of pressure P minus Pa at depth h is called the gauge pressure at that point. The area of cylinder is not appearing in the expression of absolute pressure. Thus, the height of the fluid column is important and not cross-sectional or the base area or the shape of the container. The liquid pressure is the same at all points at the same horizontal level, that is same depth. The result is appreciated through the example of hydrostatic paradox. Consider three vessels A, B and C of different shapes. They are connected at the bottom by a horizontal pipe. On filling with water, the level in the three vessels is same, though they hold different amount of water. This is so because water at the bottom has the same pressure below each section of the vessel. Atmospheric pressure and gauge pressure. The pressure of the atmosphere at any point is equal to the weight of a column of air of unit cross-sectional area extending from that point to the top of the atmosphere. At sea level, it is 1.013 into 10 to the power 5 pascals. Italian scientist Evangelista Torricelli devised for the first time a method for measuring atmospheric pressure. A long glass tube closed at one end filled with mercury is inverted into a throw of mercury as shown in figure 10.5a. 
This device is known as mercury barometer. The space above the mercury column in the tube contains only mercury vapor, whose pressure P is so small that it may be neglected. The pressure inside the column at point A must be equal to the pressure at point B, which is at the same level. Pressure at B is equal to atmospheric pressure, that is equal to PA. PA is equal to rho GH, where rho is the density of mercury and H is the height of mercury column in the tube. In the experiment, it is found that the mercury column in the barometer has a height of about 76 cm at sea level, equivalent to one atmosphere. This can also be obtained using the value rho in equation 10.8. A common way of stating pressure is in the terms of centimeter or millimeter of mercury Hg. A pressure equivalent of 1 millimeter is called a tor after torsion. 1 tor is equal to 133 pascals. The millimeter of Hg and tor are used in medicine and physiology. In meteorology, a common unit is the bar and millibar. A bar is equal to 10 to the power 5 pascals. An open tube manometer is a useful instrument for measuring pressure differences. It consists of a U-tube containing a suitable liquid, that is a low-density liquid such as oil, for measuring pressure difference and a high-density liquid such as mercury for large pressure differences. One end of the tube is open to the atmosphere and the other end is connected to the system whose pressure we want to measure. The pressure P at A is equal to pressure at point B. What we normally measure is the gauge pressure, which is P minus PA, given by equation 10.8 and is proportional to the manometer height H. Pressure is same at the same levels on both sides of the U-tube containing a fluid. For liquids, the density varies very little over the wide ranges in pressure and temperature, and we can treat it safely as a constant for our present purpose. Gas, on the other hand, exhibits large variations of density with changes in pressure and temperature. Unlike gases, liquids are therefore largely treated as incompressible. Hydraulic Machines let us now consider what happens when we change the pressure on a fluid contained in a vessel. Consider a horizontal cylinder with a piston and three vertical tubes at different points. The pressure in the horizontal cylinder is indicated by the height of the liquid column in the vertical tubes. It is necessarily the same in all. If we push the piston, the fluid level rises in all the tubes, again reaching the same level in each of them. This indicates that when the pressure on the cylinder was increased, it was distributed uniformly throughout. We can say whenever external pressure is applied on any part of a fluid contained in a vessel, it is transmitted undiminished and equally in all directions. This is Pascal's law of transmission of fluid pressure and has many applications in daily life. A number of devices such as hydraulic lift, hydraulic brakes are based on the Pascal's law. In these devices, fluids are used for transmitting pressure. In a hydraulic lift, as shown in figure 10.6, two pistons are separated by the space filled with a liquid. A piston of a small cross-sectional area A1 is used to exert a force F1 directly on the liquid. The pressure P is equal to F1 by A1 is transmitted throughout the liquid to the larger cylinder attached with the larger piston of area A2 
which results in an upward force of P into A2. Therefore, the piston is capable of supporting a large force. Large weight of say a car or a truck placed on the platform. F2 is equals to P A2 is equals to F1 A2 divided by A1. By changing the force at A1, the platform can be moved up or down. Thus, the applied force has been increased by a factor of A2 by A1 and this factor is mechanical advantage of this device. Hydraulic brakes in automobiles also work on the same principle. When we apply a little force on the pedal with our foot, the master piston moves inside the master cylinder. The pressure caused is transmitted through the brake oil to act on the piston of larger area. The large force acts on the piston and is pushed down expanding the brake shoes against the brake lining. In this way, a small force of the pedal produces a large retarding force on the wheel. An important advantage of this system is that the pressure set up by pressing pedal is transmitted equally to all the cylinders attached to the four wheels so that the braking effort is equal on all the wheels. Archimedes Principle Fluid appears to provide partial support to the object placed in it. When a body is wholly or partially immersed in a fluid at rest, the fluid exerts pressure on the surface of the body in contact with the fluid. The pressure is greater on the lower surface of the body than on the upper surface as pressure in a fluid increases with depth. The resultant of all the forces in an upward force called the buoyant force. Suppose that a cylindrical body is immersed in the fluid. The upward force on the bottom of the body is more than the downward force on its top. The fluid exerts a resultant upward force or buoyant force on the body equals to P2 minus P1 into A. We have seen in equation 10.4 that P2 minus P1 into A is equals to rho GHA. Now HA is the volume of the solid and rho HA is the weight of an equivalent volume of the fluid. P2 minus P1 into A is equals to mg. Thus, the upward force exerted is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. The result holds true irrespective of the shape of the object and here cylindrical object is considered only for convenience. This is Archimedes principle. For totally immersed objects, the volume of the fluid displaced by the object is equal to its own volume. If the density of the immersed object is more than that of fluid, the object will sink as the weight of the body is more than the upward thrust. If the density of the object is less than that of fluid, it floats in the fluid partially submerged. To calculate the volume submerged, suppose the total volume of the object is Vs and the part Vp of it is submerged in the fluid. Then the upward force which is the weight of the displaced fluid is equals to rho F G V P, which must be equal to the weight of the body. Rho S G V S is equals to rho F G V P or rho S by rho F is equals to V P by V S. The apparent weight of the floating body is zero. This principle can be summarized as the loss of weight of the body submerged partially or fully in a fluid is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. Streamline flow. So far we have studied the fluid at rest. The study of fluids in motion is known as the fluid dynamics. When a water tap is turned on slowly, the water flow is smooth initially but loses its smoothness when the speed of the outflow is increased. In studying the motion 
of fluids we focus our attention on what is happening to various fluid particles at a particular point in the space at a particular time the flow of the fluid is said to be steady if at the given point the velocity of each passing fluid particle remains constant in time this does not mean that the velocity at different points in the space is same the velocity of the particular particle may change as it moves from one point to another that is at some other point the particle may have a different velocity but every other particle which passes the second particle behaves exactly as the previous particle that has just passed that point each particle follows a smooth path and the paths of the particle do not cross each other the path taken by a fluid particle under a steady flow is a streamline it is defined as the curve whose tangent at any point is in the direction of the fluid velocity at that point consider the path of a particle as shown in figure 10.7 a the curves describe how a fluid particle moves with time the curve pq is like a permanent map of the fluid flow indicating how the fluid streams no two streamlines can cross for if they do an oncoming fluid particle can go either one way or the other and the flow would be not steady hence in steady flow the map of the flow is stationary in time how do we draw closely spaced streamlines if we intend to show streamline of every flowing particle we would end up with a continuum of lines consider the planes perpendicular to the direction of the fluid flow example at three points p r q in figure 10.7b the plane pieces are so chosen that their boundaries can be determined by the same set of the streamlines this means that the number of fluid crossing the surface as indicated at p r and q is the same if the area of cross sections at this point are ap ar and aq the speeds of the fluid particles are vp vr and vq then the mass of the fluid delta mp crossing at ap in a small interval of time delta t is rho p ap vp delta t similarly mass of the fluid delta mr flowing or crossing at ar in a small interval of time delta t is rho r ar vr delta t and mass of the fluid delta mq is rho q aq vq delta t crossing at aq the mass of the fluid flowing out equals the mass flowing in holds in all cases for the flow of incompressible fluids rho p is equals to rho r is equals to rho q the equation reduces to ap vp is equals to ar vr is equals to aq vq which is called the equation of continuity and it is a statement of conservation of mass in flow of incompressible fluids in general AV is equals to constant. AV gives the volume flux or the flow rate and remains constant throughout the pipe of flow. Thus, at narrower portions where the streamlines are closely placed, velocity increases, and it's vice versa. From Figure ten point seven b, it is clear that AR is greater than AQ. or vr is less than vq the fluid is accelerated while passing from r to q this is associated with a change in pressure in fluid in the horizontal pipe steady flow is achieved at low flow speeds 
beyond a limiting value called the critical speed this flow loses steadiness and becomes turbulent one sees this when a fast flowing stream encounters rock small foamy whirlpool like regions called white water rapids are formed figure 10.8 displays streamlines for some typical flows for example figure 10.8a describes a laminar flow where the velocities at different points in the fluid may have different magnitudes but the directions are parallel figure 10.8b gives a sketch of turbulent flow bernoulli's principle fluid flow is a complex phenomena but we can obtain some useful properties for steady or streamlined flows using the conservation of energy consider a flowing moving in a pipe of varying cross sectional area let the pipe be at varying heights as shown in figure 10.9 we now suppose that an incompressible fluid is flowing through the pipe in a steady flow its velocity must change as a consequence of equation of continuity a force is required to produce this acceleration which is caused by the fluid surrounding it the pressure must be different in different regions bernoulli's equation is a general expression that relates the pressure difference between two points in a pipe to both velocity changes kinetic energy change and elevation height changes potential energy change the swiss physicist daniel bernoulli developed this relationship in 1738 consider the flow at two regions 1 and 2 consider the fluid initially lying between b and d in an infinitesimal time interval delta t the fluid would have moved Suppose v1 is the speed at b and v2 at d then fluid initially at b has moved a distance v1 delta t to c v1 delta t is small enough to assume constant cross section along bc in the same interval delta t the fluid initially at d moves to e the distance equals to v2 delta t pressure p1 and p2 acts as shown on the plane faces of areas a1 and a2 binding the two regions the work done on the fluid at left end bc is w1 is equals to p1 a1 into v1 delta t is equals to p1 delta v since the same volume delta v passes through both the regions from equation of continuity the work done by the fluid at the other end de is equals to w2 is equals to p2 a2 into v2 delta t is equals to p2 delta v or the work done on the fluid is minus p2 delta v so the total work done on the fluid is w1 minus w2 is equals to p1 minus p2 into delta v part of this work goes into changing the kinetic energy of the fluid and part goes into changing the gravitational potential energy if the density of the fluid is rho and delta m is equals to rho a1 v1 delta t is equals to rho delta v is the mass passing through the pipe in time delta t then change in gravitational potential energy is delta u is equals to rho g delta v into h2 minus h1 the change in its kinetic energy is delta k is equals to half rho delta v into v2 square minus v1 square we can employ the work energy theorem to this volume of the fluid and this yields p1 minus p2 into delta v is equals to half rho delta v into 
v2 square minus v1 square plus rho g delta v into h2 minus h1. Now we divide the equation by delta v and then we rearrange the above terms to obtain p1 plus half rho v1 square plus rho g h1 is equals to p2 plus half rho v2 square plus rho g h2. This is Bernoulli's equation. Since 1 and 2 refers to any two locations along the pipeline, we may write the expression in general as p plus half rho v squared plus rho g h is equals to constant. In other words, the Bernoulli's relation may be stated as follows. As we move along a streamline, the sum of the pressure p, the kinetic energy per volume, v squared by 2, and the potential energy per unit volume, rho g h, remains a constant. Note that in applying the energy conservation principle, there is an assumption that no energy is lost due to friction. But in fact, when fluids flow, some energy get lost due to the internal friction. This arises due to the fact that in a fluid flow, the different layers of the fluid flow with different velocities. These layers exert frictional forces on each other resulting in a loss of energy. This property of the fluid is called the viscosity and is discussed in more detail in a later section. The lost kinetic energy of the fluid gets converted into the heat energy. Thus Bernoulli's equation ideally applies to the fluids with zero viscosity or non-viscous fluids. Another restriction on the application of Bernoulli's theorem is that the fluids must be incompressible. As the elastic energy of the fluid is also not taken into consideration. In practice, it has a large number of useful applications and can help explain a wide variety of phenomena for low viscosity incompressible fluids. Bernoulli's equation also does not hold for non-steady or turbulent flows because in that situation, velocity and pressure are constantly fluctuating in time. Speed of efflux Torricelli's law. The word efflux means the fluid outflow. Torricelli discovered that the speed of efflux from an open tank is given by a formula identical to that of the freely falling body. Consider a tank containing a liquid density rho with a small hole in its side at a height y1 from the bottom. The air above the liquid whose surface is at height y2 is at pressure P. From the equation of continuity, equation 10.10, .10, we have V1A1 is equals to V2A2. V2 is equals to A1 by A2 into V1. If the cross-sectional area of the tank A2 is much larger than that of the hole then we may take the fluid to be approximately at rest at the top. That is, V2 is equals to zero. Now applying the Bernoulli's equation at point 1 and 2 and noting that at the hole, P1 is equals to PA. When P is much and much greater than PA and 2GH may be ignored, the speed of efflux is determined by a container pressure. Such a situation occurs in rocket propulsion. On the other hand, if the tank is open to the atmosphere, then P is equals to PA and V1 is equals to under root 2GH. This is the speed of a freely falling body. Equation 10.15 that is v1 is equals to under root 2gh is known as the Torricelli's law. Venturi meter. The Venturi meter is a device to measure the flow speed of incompressible fluids. 
It consists of a tube with a broad diameter and a small constriction at the middle is shown in figure 10.11. A manometer in the form of a U-tube is also attached to it, with one arm at the broad neck point of the tube and the other at the constriction as shown in figure 10.11. The manometer contains a liquid of density rho m. The speed v1 of the fluid flowing through the tube at the broad neck area A is to be measured from the equation of continuity. The speed at the constriction becomes V2 is equals to capital A by small a into V1. Then using Bernoulli's equation we get P1 minus P2 is equals to half rho V1 square into bracket capital A upon small a whole square minus 1. This pressure difference caused the fluid in the U-tube connecting at the narrow neck to rise in comparison to the arm. The difference in the height edge measures the pressure difference. The principle behind this meter has many applications. The carburetor of automobiles has a venturi channel nozzle through which the air flows with large speed. The pressure is then lowered at the narrow neck and the petrol or gasoline is sucked up in the chamber to provide the correct mixture of air to fuel necessary for combustion. Filter pumps or aspirators, Bunsen burners, automizers, sprayers used for perfumes or to spray insecticide work on the same principle. Blood flow and heart attack. Bernoulli's principle helps in explaining blood flow in artery. The artery may get constricted due to the accumulation of plague on its inner walls. In order to drive the blood through this constriction, a greater demand is placed on the activity of the heart. The speed of the flow of blood in this region is raised which lowers the pressure inside the artery, may collapse due to the external pressure. The heart exerts further pressure to open this artery and forces the blood through. As the blood rushes through the opening, the internal pressure once again drops due to the same reasons, leading to a repeat collapse. This may result in heart attack. Dynamic Lift Dynamic lift is the force that acts on a body such as airplane wing, a hydrofoil, or a spinning ball by virtue of its motion through a fluid. In many games such as cricket, tennis ball, baseball, or golf, we notice that a spinning ball deviates from its parabolic trajectory as it moves through the air. This deviation can be partly explained on the basis of Bernoulli's theorem. 1. Ball moving without spin Figure 10.13a shows the streamlines around the non-spinning ball moving relative to a fluid. From the symmetry of streamlines, it is clear that the velocity of fluid or air above and below the ball at corresponding points is same, resulting in zero pressure difference. The air therefore exerts no upward or downward force on the ball. 2. Ball moving with spin. A ball which is spinning drags air along with it. If the surface is rough, more air will be dragged. Figure 10.13b shows the streamlines of air for a ball which is moving and spinning at the same time. The ball is moving forward and relative to it the air is moving backwards. Therefore, the velocity of air above the ball relative to it is larger and below it is smaller. The streamlines thus get crowded above and rarefied below. This difference in the velocities of the air results in the pressure difference between the lower and the upper faces, and there is a net upward force on the ball. 
This dynamic lift due to spinning is called the Magnus effect. Aerofoil or lift on aircraft wing. Figure 10.13c shows an aerofoil, which is a solid piece shaped to provide an upward dynamic lift when it moves horizontally through the air. The cross section of the wings of an aeroplane looks somewhat like the aerofoil shown in figure 10.13c, which streamlines around it. When the aerofoil moves against the wind, the orientation of the wings relative to the direction of the flow causes the streamlines to crowd together above the wing more than those below it. The flow speed on the top is higher than below it. There is an upward force resulting in a dynamic lift of the wings and this balances the weight of the plane. Viscosity. Most of the fluids are not ideal ones and offer some resistance to the motion. This resistance of the fluid motion is like an internal friction analogous to the friction when a solid moves on the surface. It is called viscosity. This force exists when there is a relative motion between layers of the liquid. Suppose we consider a fluid-like oil enclosed between two glass plates, shown in figure 10.15a. The bottom plate is fixed while the top plate is moved with a constant velocity v, relative to the fixed plate. If the oil is replaced by honey, a greater force is required to move the plate with the same velocity. Hence, we say that honey is more viscous than oil. The fluid in contact with the surface has the same velocity as that of the surface. Hence, the layer of the liquid in contact with top surface moves with a velocity v and the layer of the liquid in contact with the fixed surface is stationary. The velocity of layers increase uniformly from bottom zero velocity to the top layer velocity v. For any layer of liquid, its upper layer pulls it forward while the lower layer pulls it backwards. This results in force between the layers. This type of flow is known as laminar. The layers of the liquid slide over one another as the pages of book do when it is placed on a flat table and a horizontal force is applied to the top cover. When a fluid is flowing in a pipe or a tube, then velocity of the liquid layer along the axis of the tube is maximum and decreases gradually as we move towards the wall, where it becomes zero. The velocity on a cylindrical surface in a tube is constant. On account of this motion, a portion of liquid which at some instant has a shape a, B, C, D takes the shape A, E, F, D after short interval of time delta T. During this time interval, the liquid has undergone a shear strain of delta X by L. Since the strain in a flowing fluid increases with the time continuously. Unlike a solid, here the stress is found experimentally to depend on the rate of change of a strain or a strain rate, that is delta x by L delta T or V by L instead of a strain itself. The coefficient of viscosity pronounced eta for the fluid is defined as the ratio of shearing stress to the strain rate. F by A divided by V by L is equals to FL by VA. The SI unit of viscosity is poisily. Its other units are Newton second per meter square or Pascal second. The dimensions of viscosity are M L to the power minus 1, T to the power minus 1. Generally, thin liquids like water, alcohol, etc. are less viscous than the thick liquids like coal, tar, blood, glycerin, etc. 
The coefficients of viscosity for some common fluids are listed in the table 10.2. We point out two facts about blood and water that you may find interesting. As table 10.2 indicates, blood is thicker or more viscous than water. Further, the relative viscosity eta by eta water of blood remains constant between 0 degree Celsius and 37 degree Celsius. The viscosity of liquids decreases with the temperature while it increases in the case of gases. Stroke's law. When a body falls through a fluid, it drags a layer of the fluid in contact with it. A relative motion between the different layers of the fluid is set as a result the body experiences a retarding force. Falling of a raindrop and swinging of a pendulum bob are some common examples of such motion. It is seen that the viscous force is proportional to the velocity of the object and is opposite to the direction of motion. The other quantities on which the force F depends on viscosity eta of the fluid and the radius A of the sphere. Sir George G. Stokes, an English scientist, enunciated clearly the viscous drag force F as F is equals to 6 pi eta AV. This is known as the Stokes law. We shall not drive the Stokes law. This law is an interesting example of retarding force which is proportional to the velocity. We can study its consequence on an object falling through a viscous medium. We consider a raindrop in air. It accelerates initially due to gravity. As the velocity increases, the retarding force also increases. Finally, when the viscous force plus buoyant force becomes equal to force due to gravity, the net force becomes zero and so does the acceleration. The sphere raindrop then descends with a constant velocity. Thus, in equilibrium, this terminal velocity uvt is given by 6 pi eta av1 is equals to 4 pi by 3 into a cube into rho minus sigma g, where rho and the sigma are mass densities of sphere and the fluid respectively. We obtain Vt is equals to 2a square into rho minus sigma into g divided by 9r. So the terminal velocity Vt depends on the square of radius of a sphere and inversely on viscosity of the medium. Reynolds number. When the rate of flow of a fluid is large, the flow no longer remains laminar but becomes turbulent. In a turbulent flow, the viscosity of the fluid at any point in the space varies rapidly and randomly with time. Some circular motions called eddies are also generated. An obstacle placed in the path of a fast-moving fluid causes turbulence. The smoke rising from a burning stack of wood, oceanic currents are turbulent. Twinkling of stars is the result of atmospheric turbulence. The waves in the water and in the air left by cars, aeroplanes and boats are also turbulence. Osborne Reynolds observed that turbulent flow is less likely for viscous fluid flowing at low rates. He defined a dimensionless number whose value is given on an approximate idea whether the flow would be turbulent. This number is called the Reynolds number Re. Re is equals to rho v divided by eta, where rho is the density of the fluid flowing with the speed v, d stands for the dimension of the pipe, and eta is the viscosity of the fluid. Re is dimensionless number, and therefore it remains same in any system of units. It is therefore found that the flow is streamlined or laminar for Re 
less than 1000. The flow is turbulent for Re greater than 2000. The flow becomes unsteady for Re between 1000 and 2000. The critical value of Re known as the critical Reynolds number at which the turbulence sets is found to be the same for geometrically similar flows. For example, when oil and water with their different densities and viscosities flow in pipes for same shapes and size, turbulence sets in at almost the same values of Re. Using this fact, a small-scale laboratory model can be set up to study the character of the fluid flow. They are useful in designing of ships, submarines, racing car and aeroplanes. RE can also be written as RE is equals to rho v square by eta v by d is equals to rho a v square by eta a v by d is equals to inertial force or the force of viscosity. Thus, Reynolds number represents the ratio of the inertial force, force due to inertia, that is mass of moving fluid due to inertia of obstacle in its path, to viscous force. Turbulence dissipates kinetic energy usually in the form of heat. Racing cars and planes are engineered to precision in order to minimize turbulence. The design of such vehicle involve experimentation and trial and error. On the other hand, turbulence like friction is sometimes desirable. Turbulence promotes mixing and increase the rate of transfer of mass, momentum and energy. The blades of a kitchen mixture induce turbulent flow and provide thick milkshakes as well as beat eggs into a uniform texture. Surface Tension You must have noticed that oil and water do not mix. Water wets you and me but not ducks. Mercury does not wet glass but water sticks to it. Oil rise up a cotton wick in spite of gravity. Sap and water rise up to the top of the leaves of the tree. Hairs of a paintbrush do not cling together when dry and even when dipped in water, but form a fine tip when taken out of it. All of these and many more such experience are related with free surface of fluids. As liquids have no definite shape but have a definite volume, they acquire a free surface when poured in a container. These surfaces possess some additional energy. This phenomena is known as surface tension and is concerned with only liquids as gases do not have free surface. Let us understand this phenomena. Surface energy a liquid stays together because of attraction between molecules. Consider a molecule well inside a liquid. The intermolecular distance are such that it is attracted to all the surrounding molecules. This attraction results in a negative potential energy of the molecule, which depends on the number and distribution of molecules around the chosen one but the average potential energy of all the molecules is the same. This is supported by the fact that to take a collection of such molecules, the liquid, and to disperse them far away from each other in order to evaporate or vaporize, the heat of evaporation required is quite large. For water, it is of the order of 40 kilojoules per mole. Let us consider a molecule near the surface. Only lower half side of it is surrounded by the liquid molecules. There is some negative potential energy due to these, but obviously it is less than that of molecules in bulk. That is, the one fully inside approximately is half of the later
Does the molecule on a liquid surface have some extra energy in comparison to the molecules in the interior? A liquid does tends to have least surface area which external condition permits. Increasing surface area requires energy. Most surface phenomena can be understood in terms of this fact. What is the energy required for having a molecule at the surface? As mentioned above, roughly it is the half of the energy required to remove it entirely from the liquid. That is half the heat of evaporation. Finally, what is a surface? Since a liquid consists of molecules moving about, there cannot be perfectly sharp surface. The density of the liquid molecules drops rapidly to zero, around z is equals to zero, as we move along the direction indicated, figure 10.16c, in a distance of the order of a few molecular size. Surface energy and surface tension. As we have discussed that an extra energy is associated with the surface of liquids. The creation of more surface, spreading of surface, keeping other things like volume fixed requires additional energy. To appreciate this, consider a horizontal liquid film ending in the bar free to slide over parallel guides. Figure 10.17 Suppose we move the bar by a small distance d as shown. Since the area of the surface increases, the system now has more energy. This means that some work has been done against the internal force. Let this internal force be F. The work done by the applied force is Fd. From conservation of energy, this is stored as additional energy in the film. If the surface energy of the film is S per unit area, the extra area is 2 dL. A film has two sides and the liquid in between, so that there are two surfaces and extra energy is S into 2 dL is equals to Fd or S is equals to Fd by 2 dL is equals to F by 2 L. The quantity S is the magnitude of surface tension. It is equal to the surface energy per unit area of the liquid interface and is also equal to the force per unit length exerted by the fluid on the movable bar. So far we have talked about the surface of one liquid. More generally, we need to consider fluid surface in contact with other fluids or solid surfaces. The surface energy in that case depends on the material on both sides of the surface. For example, if the molecules of the material attracted each other, surface energy is reduced, while if they repel each other, the surface energy is increased. Thus, more appropriately, the surface energy is the energy of interface between two materials and depends on both of them. We make the following observations from above. 1. Surface tension is a force per unit length or surface energy per unit area acting in the plane of the interface between the plane of the liquid and any other substance. It also is the extra energy that the molecules at the interface have as compared to the molecules in the interior. 2. At any point on the interface besides the boundary, we can draw a line and imagine equal and opposite surface tension forces S per unit length of the line acting perpendicular to the line. In the plane of the interface, the line is in equilibrium. To be more specific, imagine a line of atoms or molecules at the surface. The atoms to the left pull the line towards them. Those to the right pull it towards them. 
This line of atoms is in equilibrium under tension. If the line really marks the end of the intersurface, as in figure 10.16a and b, there is only the force S per unit length acting inwards. Table 10.3 gives the surface tension of various liquids. The value of surface tension depends on temperature. Like viscosity, the surface tension of a liquid usually falls with temperature. A fluid will stick to a solid surface if the surface energy between fluid and the solid is smaller than the sum of the surface energies between solid air and fluid air. Now there is a cohesion between the solid surface and the liquid. It can be directly measured experimentally and schematically shown in figure 10.18. A flat vertical glass plate below which a vessel of some liquid is kept. From one arm of the balance, the plate is balanced by weight on the other side, with its horizontal edge just over water. The vessel is raised slightly till the liquid just touches the glass plate and pulls it down a little because of surface tension. Weights are added till the plate just clears water. Suppose the additional weight required is W. Then from equation 10.24 and the discussion given there, the surface tension of the liquid air interface is S is equals to W by 2L is equals to Mg by 2L, where M is the extra mass and L is the length of the plate edge. The subscript LA emphasizes the fact that the liquid air interface tension is involved. Angle of contact. The surface of liquid near the plane of contact with another medium is in general curved. The angle between the tangent to the liquid surface at the point of contact and solid surface inside the liquid is termed as the angle of contact. It is denoted by theta. It is defined at interface of different pairs of liquids and solids. The value of theta determines whether a liquid will spread on the surface of a solid or it will form droplets on it. For example, water forms droplets on a lotus leaf, as shown in figure 10.9a, while it spreads on a clean plastic plate, as shown in figure 10.19b. We consider the three interfacial tensions at all three interfaces, liquid air, solid air, and solid liquid, denoted by SLA, SSA, SSL respectively, as given in figure 10.19a and b. At the line of contact, the surface forces between the three media must be in equilibrium. From figure 10.19b, the following relation is easily derived. SLA cos theta plus SL is equals to SSA. The angle of contact is an obtuse angle. If SL is greater than SLA, as in the case of water leaf interface, while it is an acute angle, if SSL is less than SLA, as in the case of water plastic interface, when theta is an obtuse angle, then molecules of liquids are attracted strongly to themselves and weakly to those of solids. It costs a lot of energy to create solid liquid surface and liquid does not wet the solid. This is what happens with water on waxy or oily surface and with mercury on any surface. On the other hand, if the molecules of the liquid are strongly attracted to those of solids, this will reduce SSL and therefore cos theta may increase or theta may decrease. In this case, theta is an acute angle. This is what happens for water on glass 
or on plastic or for kerosene oil on virtually anything. It just spreads. Soap detergents and dyeing substances are wetting agents. When they are added, the angle of contact becomes small so that these may penetrate well and becomes effective. Waterproofing agents, on the other hand, are added to create a large angle of contact between water and fibers. Drops and Bubbles One consequence of surface tension is that free liquid drops and bubbles are spherical if effects of gravity can be neglected. You may have seen this especially clearly in the small drops just formed in a high-speed spray or jet and in soap bubbles blown by most of us in childhood. Why are drops and bubbles spherical? What keeps soap bubbles stable? As we have been saying repeatedly, a liquid air interface has energy. So for a given volume, the surface with minimum energy is the one with the least area. The sphere has this property. Though it is out of the scope of this book, but you can check that a sphere is better than at least a cube in this respect. So if gravity and other forces, example air resistance, were ineffective, liquid drops would be spherical. Another interesting consequence of surface tension is that the pressure inside a spherical drop is more than the pressure outside. Suppose a spherical drop of radius R is in equilibrium. If its radius increased by delta r, the extra surface energy is 8 pi r delta r into S L A. If the drop is in equilibrium, this energy cost is balanced by the energy gain due to the expansion under the pressure difference P inside minus P outside between the inside of the bubble and outside. The work done is W is equals to P inside minus P outside into 4 pi R square into delta R. So that P inside minus P outside is equals to 2 S L A by R. In general, for a liquid gas interface, the convex side has a higher pressure than the concave side. For example, an air bubble in a liquid would have higher pressure inside. A bubble differs from a drop and a cavity. In this, it has two interfaces. Applying the above argument we have for a bubble, P inside minus P outside is equals to 4 SLA by R. This is probably when you have to blow hard, but not too hard to form a soap bubble. A little extra air pressure is needed inside. Capillary rise. One consequence of pressure difference across a curved liquid air interface is the well-known effect that the water rises up in a narrow tube in spite of gravity. The word capilla means hair in Latin. If the tube were hair thin, the rise would be very large. To see this, consider a vertical capillary tube of circular cross-section radius A inserted in an open vessel of water. The contact angle between the water and glass is acute. Thus, the surface of water in the capillary is concave. This means there is a pressure difference between the two sides of the top surface. This is given by P inside minus P outside is equals to 2s by r is equals to 2s by a sec theta. Thus, the presence of the water inside the tube just at the meniscus air water interface is less than the atmospheric pressure. Consider the two points A and B in figure 10.21a. They must be at the same pressure, namely, P outside plus h rho g is equals to P inside is equals to Pa, where rho is the density of water and h is the height called the capillary rise. Using equation, we have h rho g is equals to pressure inside minus pressure outside is equals to 2s cos theta by A. The discussion here 
the equation 10.28 and 10.29 make it clear that the capillary rise due to the surface tension. It is larger for a smaller A. Typically, it is of the order of a few centimeters for fine capillaries. For example, if A is equals to 0.05 cm using the value of surface tension for water, we find that H is equals to 2.98 cm. Notice that if the liquid meniscus is convex, as for mercury, that is if cos theta is negative, then it is clear that the liquid will be lower in the capillary. Detergents and surface tension. We clean dirty clothes containing grease and oil stains sticking to cotton or other fabric by adding detergent or soap to the water, soaking cloth in it and shaking. Let us understand this process better. Washing with water does not remove grease stains. This is because water does not wet greasy dirt. That is, there is a very little area of contact between them. If water could wet grease, the flow of water could carry some grease away. Something of this sort is achieved through detergents. The molecules of detergent are hairpin shaped, with one end attracted to the water and other to the molecules of grease, oil or wax, thus tending to form water oil interface. The result is shown in figure 10.22 as a sequence of figures. In our language, we would say that addition of detergents whose molecules attract at one end and say oil on the other reduces drastically the surface tension S, water oil. It may even become energetically favorable to form such interface, that is globes of dirt around the detergents and then by water. This kind of process using surface active detergents or surfactants is important not only for cleaning but also in recovering oil, mineral ores, etc. Summary 1. The basic property of a fluid is that it can flow. The fluid does not have any resistance to change of its shape. Thus the shape of a fluid is governed by shape of its container. 2. A liquid is incompressible and has a free surface of its own. A gas is compressible and it expands to occupy all the space available to it. 3. If F is the normal force exerted by a fluid on an area A, then the average pressure P average is defined as the ratio of force to area. P average is equals to F by A. Fourth, the unit of the pressure is the Pascal. It is the same as Newton per meter square. Other common units of pressure are 1. Atmosphere is equals to 1.01 into 10 to the power 5 pascals, 1 bar is equals to 10 to the power 5 pascals, 1 tor is equals to 133 pascals, 1 millimeter of Hg is equals to 1 tor is equals to 133 pascals. 5. Pascal's law states that pressure in a fluid at rest is same at all points which are at the same height. A change in pressure applied to an enclosed fluid is transmitted undiminished to every point of the fluid and the walls of the containing vessel. 6. The pressure in a fluid varies with depth h according to the expression P is equals to Pa plus rho gh, where rho is the density of fluid assumed uniform. 7. The volume of an incompressible fluid Passing at any point every second in a pipe of non-uniform cross-section is the same in the steady flow. Va is equals to constant. The equation is due to mass conservation in incompressible fluid flow. 8. Bernoulli's principle states that as we move along a streamline, the sum of the pressure P and kinetic energy per unit volume and the potential energy per unit volume remains constant. The equation is basically the conservation of energy applied to non-viscous fluid 
motion in a steady state. There is no fluid which have zero viscosity, so the above statement is true only approximately. The viscosity is like friction and converts the kinetic energy to heat energy. Ninth, though shear strain in a fluid does not require shear stress, when a shear stress is applied to a fluid, the motion is generated, which causes a shear strain growing with time. The ratio of the shear stress to the time rate of shearing strain is known as coefficient of viscosity eta. Tenth, the Stokes law states that a viscous drag force F on a sphere of radius A moving with velocity V through a fluid of viscosity is F is equals to 6 pi eta AV. Eleventh, the onset of turbulence in a fluid is determined by a dimensionless parameter called the Reynolds number given by Re is equals to rho mu d by eta. Twelfth, surface tension is a force per unit length acting in a plane of interface between the liquid and the bounding surface. It is the extra energy that the molecules at the interface have as compared to the interior. Points to ponder. Pressure is a scalar quantity. The definition of pressure as force per unit area may give a false impression that pressure is a vector. The force in the numerator of the definition is the component of the force normal to the area upon which it is impressed. While describing fluids as a conceptual shift from the particle and rigid body mechanics is required, we are concerned with properties that vary from point to point in a fluid. One should not think of pressure of a fluid as being exerted only on a solid like walls of a container or piece of solid matter immersed in a fluid. Pressure exerts at all point in a fluid. An element of a fluid is in equilibrium because the pressure exerted on the various faces are equal. The expression of pressure is P is equals to PA plus rho GH holds true only if the fluid is incompressible. Practically speaking, it holds for liquids which are largely incompressible and hence is a constant with height. The gauge pressure is the difference of the actual pressure and the atmosphere pressure. Many pressure measuring devices measure the gauge pressure. These include the tire pressure gauge and the blood pressure gauge is sphygma manometer. A streamline is a map of fluid flow. In a steady flow, two streamlines do not intersect as it means that the fluid particle will have two possible velocities at the point. Bernoulli's principle does not hold in the presence of viscous drag on the fluid. The work done by this dissipative viscous force must be taken into account in this case, and P2 will be lower than the value given by equation 10.12. As the temperature rises, the atoms of the liquid becomes more mobile and the coefficient of viscosity eta falls. In a gas, the temperature rise increases the random motion of the atoms and eta increases. The critical Reynolds number for the onset of turbulence is in the range 1000 to 10,000, depending on the geometry of the flow. For most cases, Reynolds number is less than 1000 signifies the minor flow. Reynolds number from 1000 to 2000 is unsteady flow, and Reynolds number more than 1000 implies turbulent flow. Surface tension arises due to the axis potential energy of the molecules on the surface in comparison to the potential energy in the interior. Such a surface energy is present at interface separating two substances, at least one of which is a fluid. It is not the property of a single fluid alone.